Hi everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be able to be here, albeit virtually, uh, to talk to you about music and making music. Um, I hope you find this informative and I hope you find it fun. Time past and time present meet in time future, a study of the musical impulse. In a sense, I guess we could say a study of the human impulse because our relationship to time, which uh, clearly is a foundational issue in the performance and the perception of music, it is of course just as embedded in every experience that we have, any kind of experience that we have in our lives. Um, Stravinsky said that uh, through music, we explain our relationship to time. And I wanna look at some of those things today. Um, the quote, by the way, the whole quote, the, the title of this came from me just remembering a line from uh, T.S. Eliot from The Four Quartets. And uh, a larger part of that quote, he says, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future. And time future contained in time past, if all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. Uh, you can see that I took out the perhaps from Eliot because I think that there's no perhaps about it. That was a very Eliot kind of ambiguous uh, statement. But time present and time past are both present in time future. When we're thinking about time, if we think deeply about it, um, it's a little bit dizzying because um, we have these three tenses that we talk about, past, present, and future, and yet when we meditate on this, we realize that um, all three of these tenses are utter fictions. Um, if the past is no longer and the future is not what yet is, where is the present? Because at the moment that we perceive the present, it's past. So in a sense, all three of these uh, aspects of time, there's a fundamental sense in which none of them exist. And of course, we all know that in another fundamental sense, they very clearly exist. And that's one of the riddles, one of the conundrums of time. Um, to my mind, the only way they exist at all is in memory and in process. Um, if you think of natural processes, um, whether we are there to perceive them or not, they are happening. And if you think of our relationship to knowledge and experience, um, it's memory that is the glue. It's memory that is the sort of spiritual cement that holds all three of those tenses together. The first thing I want to talk about before talking about meaning in music is to talk about meaning in sound in general. And I think a really good way of, of starting with that is through language, because when we're playing an instrument, there's such a, a strong athletic dimension to what we're doing um, in order to just execute the notes and get the sound out of the instrument. That's so much work that sometimes the gold star that we can give ourselves for playing the right rhythms and the right notes, and that's a good thing, um, can supersede sometimes actually our search for meaning in a, in a kind of ironic way. Um, meaning in sound is going to be created through the way that we shape sound. And I mean, one way that, that if you think about when you're talking with somebody and, and they say, hey, uh, do you want to go down to uh, 
the mall? And if we answer, okay, that certainly indicates one kind of relationship to going down to the mall. If we say, if the person says, you want to go down to the mall, and the person answers, okay, then the, the words are the same, but the meaning is utterly different. And it's very important for us to remember that when we're making music, that the way that we actually shape the sound is going to determine the meaning that we're expressing and that the listener is going to perceive. Um, a very clear way of, of showing this is if you, if you read something that is very everyday, but you use like a profound uh, declamation of it, I mean, it's absurd. If you took a piece of paper, you said, oh, I want to read you something. And then you looked up and you said, a quart of milk, a loaf of bread. I mean, that's like, a, it's, a, it's a shopping list. It's, it's, I mean, it doesn't, so the, the humor just comes out of the mismatch between the way that we're saying it and what we're saying. But if we're saying something that is profound, if we're saying something that is deeply meaningful, but then we say it like it's a laundry list, well, that doesn't work either. I mean, if you say something like, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring is to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown, remembered gate at the point of the last beginning, a place not known, because not looked for, but, okay, I mean, so, that once again, there's an utter mismatch. If you're going, to, if you're going to trouble to write or say that, and by the way, this is the end of the four quartets. Then the way that we're saying the words, both in terms of the rhythm, the stress, the accent, the tempo, should match what we're saying. So at this end here, at the end, Eliot says, "We shall not cease." from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time through the unknown remembered gate at the point of the last beginning a place not known because not looked for but heard half heard like the stillness between two waves of the sea quick now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire and the fire and the rose are one. Okay, that's not a laundry list. So um, uh, I think that when we're, when we're playing music, we have to remind ourselves that in the same way that we would, if, we were, if we're speaking meaning, meaningfully through language, that we want to do the same thing in, in sound. And, uh, and that we're constantly thinking about how we're shaping sound. Um, chapter one finishes here. Chapter two. In creating a performance, one of the things, uh, going back to the Stravinsky quote, if, if, if we're talking about definitions of things and meanings of things, one of the things I think that's particularly important for a musician who wants to be a performer is to think about what a performance actually is. Um, I, I wouldn't think about this uh, if you're just off stage getting ready to walk out on stage and do a performance. That wouldn't be a good time to be thinking about this. 
but in the course of your study um, and in, in your time of, of reflection, it's good to think about what your relationship, what the, the transactional relationship is going to be between you and your audience. And um, I think a performance, if we look at it, it actually is uh, multifold. It's, it's a number of things, um, and not only one thing, but certainly one aspect of performing is that you are occupying a position, not only physically on stage, but a position of how you feel, what you feel the meaning of the piece is, and what you want your audience to experience. So you're, you're occupying that position and you're taking a stand. You're not equivocating, you're saying that this is the way this piece should go. It also means to accept responsibility. There's certainly a sense, not the only sense, but there's also a sense of domination, of, of taking charge of the bit of time that you have control over. When an audience comes to hear you play, what they're telling you by sitting silently and watching you is that they're ceding control of time to you. That's, that's the relationship. That's the deal. Um, a performance also means to give away. To give away everything that you have. There'll be nothing left. At the end of the performance, every sound will have floated off uh, diaphanously into the ether. So we're giving everything away when we're performing. There's a wonderful tradition in a number of American Indian uh, tribes, Native American tribes, uh, which is called a potlatch. And if, if you're the chief of your tribe, periodically you have to give everything away that you own. So in this tradition, the chief doesn't acquire things. They acquire them, but then they regularly give it all away to every other member. I think that's a really good metaphor for a performance. Give everything away. To perform also means to serve. It means to support. It means to control. It means to inhabit. It means to witness. It means to identify. Uh, there's a wonderful story. Uh, the first time, time Debussy heard Wanda Landowska, the great uh, early 20th century uh, harpsichordist, play Bach in a, in a concert, Debussy rushed back after the concert and he embraced her and he said, finally, someone who plays Bach like he's their friend. So, I mean, and, and I, I, I love that story because if you're going to play a, a, a composer, no matter how great, you must feel they're equal. You have to identify with them. Um, and then finally, um, the performance is a transformation. And a lot, a lot of this transfer, transformation can happen in the course of our preparation for performance. And as I see it, the transformations that happen is that we turn data into knowledge, sensation into experience, usefulness into meaning, interest into love and efficiency into care. So here we are, chapter three. Um, what is the work that goes in to making a performance? The next thing that I wanna talk about because of the work that goes into making a performance is precisely how we are describing time, past, present, and future, that exists in the flow of the piece and that is begun, continues, and, and ends. Um, one time, a number of years ago, um, I was playing a concert uh, with my former duo partner, Ron Pearl, and I remember it was in Withville, Virginia. This was maybe 20, 25 years ago. 
And um, after the performance, there was a reception, and this nice young guy came up, and he said, I really, I really liked your performance. He said, I, I, I loved all the things that, that you all did. And um, he said, who, who do you study with? And uh, I, at that point, I think I was uh, in my mid-30s. It had been mid or late 30s. And uh, I said, well, I don't study with, with anyone now. I, I had a wonderful teacher, but it's been like 14 years or so since, since I had a lesson. And then he looked really puzzled. And he just paused for a moment. He looked confused and he said, um, then who, who tells you what to do? And I said, what? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand what you mean. And he says, well, you got louder and softer and you went faster and slower and, and some of the notes were short and some of them were long. And he said, who, who gives you permission? Like who, who, who tells you what to do? All of those things. And I kind of realized what he was saying at that point, and I said, well, well, the music tells us. And then he, he looked even more confused. We talked, we had a, another uh, cup of punch and talked a little bit more about, about musical shaping. Um, the score, of course, is where we, we start from. And for classical musicians, most of the, the, the work that we do in, in learning pieces is from score. One time I was giving a talk at a summer camp and uh, uh, I, I asked the, the, there were like 20, 25 folks there and I said, um, what is public enemy number one for a classical musician? And everybody kind of looked around and were like, wow, I, I'm, I can't wait for this answer. And I held the score up and I said this, this is public enemy number one because the score, because it looks so definite, it's so exact, it's such an ingenious um, data storage form, so detailed that um, it can, in an interesting way, isolate us from sound and not become the platform and um, the catapult into an experience that we do not yet know and an experience that we're going to create. Um, Arthur Schnabel, the great uh, early 20th century pianist, um, there's a wonderful book that he wrote, it's called The, uh, the Interpretations of Arthur Schnabel, and um, uh, it's by a guy named Conrad Wolf. And there's a statement in there that struck me once when I read this, I guess I was an undergrad, and Schnabel said, if Beethoven marks piano in a score. He said, you should play it softly, but not because he wrote piano, but because you understand why that passage must be soft. So this is the whole idea of translating data into experience and, and, and uh, taking uh, the facticity of the score and turning it into meaning. Welcome back to chapter four. Um, I've prepared a recording with a number of excerpts of uh, three or four pieces from uh, our standard rep that are really good examples of the different kinds of, of shaping of sound that uh, I talked about earlier in, uh, in our talk today. And uh, I hope you enjoy them. It's about uh, 19 minutes of uh, these different excerpts with explanations of the musical impulse uh, that's behind the thinking and the execution of them. It's a hallmark of modern pedagogy, which begins in the late 1700s, that um, as a form of teaching, music is broken down into its component parts and then exercises are made up that address those component uh, sonic 
textures that are going to be used in repertoire. Um, and that's essentially what drives a lot of pedagogical exercises to this very day. I've always thought that, I mean, we've seen the efficacy of doing that in gaining uh, fluency in different kinds of gestures very rapidly by focusing on one thing at a time. Uh, for my students, I have them do the same thing with expressive gestures. And so essentially, it works in three tiers. And they're all internally motivated. So the first thing that I suggest to them is that they should think of an emotion, an emotion that they want to convey, and then make one sound, one pitch, that will carry that emotion. So for example, if you wanted to play a sound that was going to be mischievous and cheeky and somewhat puck-like, then think of that emotion. You might go, if you wanted to play, I'm going to play a chord now, if you wanted to play a chord that was majestic, then you probably wouldn't go, but rather, um, if you thought of um, an emotion that was brutal, then maybe something like a chord like that. And so essentially their assignment is to take a, a series of adjectives that describe emotions, and nouns that describe emotion, and then make one sound, either, a, either a, a pitch or a chord that makes that emotion and that's internally generated. Um, Beethoven, at the top of the score of the Misa Solemnis, wrote, from the heart, may it go to the heart. And I think for a performer, the million dollar question is, how do you get into the heart? Um, and internal motivation is one big part of that in terms of shaping sound. The second step is to play a motive, a very short motive, maybe three notes, maybe five notes, once again also um, conveying a particular emotion. So if we were going to do something that was maybe somewhat bittersweet or melancholy, the, the idea there in A minor vibrating the minor third, and then also the flat six degree. Uh, this can be made up in the ear, but I also advise my students to use what they know about the structure of music to help them to create their emotions just as composers do. And then the next step, the third tier would be to make up small harmonic progressions uh, that will cadence in different ways. So, for example, if you went... I guess you'll have to believe that I'm improvising that. Um, for uh, my students then, this would be a part of their practice that they would dedicate maybe 15 minutes um, at some point in their practice where they would be internally generating an emotion and then creating in sound that emotion. In a sheet that I have given to my students a number of years ago, which I call the 10 Principles of Work in Motion, 
Uh, number 10 states this, accuracy and ease of playing is enhanced, in some cases made possible, by coordinating the physical gestures of performance with the emergence of sound as it unfolds in the piece we are playing. In its highest form, it is a perfect correspondence of human physiology, instrumental topography, and musical syntax. It acknowledges the relation of sound to time and space. The Targa piece that I just played is a really excellent example. I realize that's a lot of words, uh, but essentially what it's saying is um, you, a composer, uh, particularly the composer that's writing for an instrument that they play, is looking for a way of matching how the body moves with the structure of the instrument and then with the grammar and syntax of the piece that they're writing. And as I say, this little miniature is, is a perfect example in, in the piece. The open string, the open B string, is, ha is an accompaniment. And particularly at the moment where you have the large shift to the upper register of the guitar, the open B string corresponds also with the closure of the phrase where you're going to do a slight rallentando. So Targa, in this piece, the composer, um, has, as I say, coordinated the space and temporal element of shifting with the grammatical element of the cadence. music, notes can behave like characters, and in the opening of this uh, beautiful little miniature, Gondoliera by Johann Caspar Mertz, the, the high G is the hero of this phrase, the, this opening section of this piece. And as you heard, um, it starts out as part of a dissonant chord, and then a resolved chord, and then a dissonant chord, and then a resolved chord, C, G, and then G again. Um, so even though there are no markings in this score as to relative differences of dynamics, because of the relationship of the G to the harmony underneath, um, one is really obliged to show that with different dynamics. And one of the things that I talk about with my students in their interpretive training is that harmony is always about relationship and the melody is in context to that. So just the first line here.
places what is merely an idea into a musical context. And one can see also that Mertz rhythmically activates the second dissonance with a dotted note and then also with a leap from the G. on the death of Debussy by Manuel de Falla that you just heard is a great example of really the title of this talk, Motion and Emotion in Music. One of the things that I talk to my students about is the importance of developing different types of choreographies that they equate with a particular sound. Indeed, I think that fluency for a concert player is essentially conjoining a movement in the hands with a particular sound. The movement and the sound for a fluent player are really one thing. They're like thunder and lightning. It's, they're not two distinct things, but two different parts of the same phenomenon. One's aural, one's visual, but they're both related to the same event of an atmosphere ionized that's going a little bit crazy. Um, at the very beginning of this piece, you have that great dissonant chord. Uh, it's often played with this right hand fingering. I like to pull the thumb through all three strings, and as you can hear, it not only gives a louder sound, but it gives a more raw and rough and anguished quality to the chord. So the actual choreography itself, whether you use the thumb, index, and middle finger, or the thumb pulling through, changes both the timbre, but also, as you can hear, the emotion of the chord. I think, as I say, this is a, a good example of um, choreography as it relates to timbre and emotion. Also, in later in this phrase, that great B flat. One of the things also I think that that's a hallmark of uh, performances that we remember are performances that have special notes. In this case, not just special notes in the piece, but special notes in the way that you play it. To make the, that B flat brighter and to put a little bit of a whammy bar vibrato on it, brings out the slight hysteria that's happening harmonically at that point in the piece.
piece you just heard is Lido Navorta, also by Johann Caspar Mehr. It's another really lovely uh, Romantic period uh, miniature. Um, the, the beginning of this piece brings out the whole issue of vocalization, which is a different kind of, of motion in music. And this phrase at the beginning, that begins the piece has this um, wonderful little leap. Now all of those notes are really eighths, so those are the arithmetic durations of those notes. Pitches have two kinds of duration. One is arithmetic, which are the notated rhythms, and the other is expressive. So to, to, as you can see, the arithmetic durations, while in one sense they're correct, are utterly wrong. Um, that they show no vocal character at all. Whereas shows the energy that's needed that's needed to actually make that leap if you were singing. Now, at the end of the piece, this same phrase occurs once again, and it comes after a very tempestuous middle part of this section. I just played the, the intro at the beginning. Um, when I play it at the end, I play it in what's called an upper position on the guitar. Which, as you can hear, gives a much more muted uh, timbre, and you can vibrate it more. As opposed to the beginning where I play it in lower position. The open position has, for me, the tone color itself embodies a character of naivete, of innocence, of freshness. And then the upper position, closed position, in, in addition to being more muted, has a quality of reminiscence or nostalgia. So here, the motion is from one area of the neck to another area of the neck to create a different emotional atmosphere with the same pitches. Continuing the Merzfest, this piece is called Capriccio. Um, this is a very good uh, example, or I guess it, it, it's a very good potential environment for the use of tone color as it um, is allied with consonants and dissonance within harmony. 
at the beginning of the melody itself. As I'm playing those arpeggios, starting with Certainly one of the strengths of the guitar is its large uh, timbral palette and the detail that one can bring to it. So as I'm going... Um, you can hear once again that, I mean, essentially the brighter timbre is more dissonant. The more round and full timbre is more consonant. And I think one doesn't need to go to a conservatory even to hear that, that if you play or even the same decibel level, um, this is a more active sound and this is a more complete, better, uh, restful sound. Um, also in this score, um, this is a really good example of Romantic period composers giving us words. At this section, he has marked resoluto. Um, if you were playing right at tempo, it doesn't really give the sense of, of resolve, um, of commitment to those chords. By doing a slight allargando at the end, it gives the sense of the, the resolution of the speaker. Back again. Um, thank you very much for uh, your attention. I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk today. And uh, I look forward to any and all of your questions and to uh, working with many of you this week. Thank you.